Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans alike, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. One of the couple, two, three best podcasts around. So sit back, grab yourself a cold one and a pole of sausage, park your keister in the front room, and listen to Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. In Chicago, you know that all sports rock. The Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Sox. Pick your favorite, you can choose as long as the... Packers lose for everything you need to know. It's Bill Swarski Sports Talk Chicago. Bill Swarski Sports Talk Chicago. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Bill Swarski Sports Talk Chicago. This is your hosts, Alex and Sean. On today's episode, we have a ton to talk about, including some absolutely dreadful Blackhawks losses, the Bulls sliding into the playoffs. Uh, opening day for Cubs and White Sox, and some Bears things to talk about. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Rockford Ice Hogs. If you're not familiar with the Rockford Ice Hogs, they're the AHL minor league affiliate of the Chicago Blackhawks. What does that mean for you? You could see the stars of tomorrow today at family-friendly, affordable prices. Season is still going on, so head on over to icehogs.com. You should have a hat, shirt, jersey, tickets, and more. Tell them Swirsky Sports sent you. Alex, how does it make you feel? that you have been to 100% of the Cubs losses this year. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel particularly good. And I would like to add this note that since Thursday, this past Thursday, I've seen not one, but two Chicago losses in person. So off to a rip roaring start in 2022. Go me. What's the other one? Uh, I was at the Blackhawks game Thursday night, and that's another topic I know we're going to get on later. Because I was was at that game, too. You were? I was. Where were you sitting? Uh, 225 section. Okay, I was in the 300. I was in 305. Yeah, it was a last-minute thing. My, uh, My best friend, his dad is in town. Her mom and dad are in town. And their last day in Chicago, he, uh, He's like, oh, I got tickets and we have an extra one. Do you want to come tonight? And I was like, um, let me just make sure that my wife can pick up the kid. And if so, I can go. My wife's like, yeah, it's fine. So I went to the game and uh, yeah, so I pretty much I left work. I texted him at like four, left work, went straight down there, took the L. And um, yeah, it was a terrible game. Awful. I mean, dreadful. I, I mean, it was... It was a, a, a team that was even worse than you in the Seattle Kraken, and you couldn't get anything going. Weren't they outshot like something like 18 to five or something in the first period alone? It was first it was period. I think it was, I think it was like 17 to four or something like that. Yeah. I mean, the Hawks did make it closer, but that first period was brutal. And it wasn't even the score or them losing, it was just the way they played. I mean, they had almost two minutes. Of a five on three. Yeah. And I don't, did they even get a shot on goal? They got maybe one or two. If, if that, they, the, their inability to connect with a pass or to just make anything happen on the boards, just, oh, it was nauseating to watch. But, but the price of admission was worth it alone. Getting to the atrium just in time to see Marion Hosta sign that contract. I don't know if you were there for that. Were you in the atrium when that happened? I wasn't. I got there like right as puck was dropping. So I didn't, okay. get, the, I didn't get the pennant either. Oh, I, I got that hanging up right now. The pennant is really, really cool. And that was, it was like a little consolation prize for having to see that terrible game. But it was really cool because everyone was crammed elbow to elbow in the atrium you had a whole deck full of media people and not just Chicago media. I mean, people from the NHL, people from the hall of fame. I mean, it was a big get together in the atrium and uh, everyone was going crazy when Hosa took the stage. He did his little, um, it wasn't really a speech. It was more of an interview. They were asking him questions up on the podium. You know, uh, you think you made the right choice uh, choosing Chicago? Oh yeah, definitely. I make right choice to come to Chicago. And, you know, the Marion Hosa talks and everyone keeps cheering some more. He signs the deal. Everyone cheers again. And then as he was walking out towards the side, I walked out of the atrium right after he left the stage. And as soon as I got into the hall, I looked behind me and Marion Hosa just comes right behind and walks right behind me. So I'm like, 
oh, wow, he's right there again. That's really cool. And then I know you were there for this, but finding out that his number was going to be retired. Yeah, that was really cool. Uh, that was, that was a, awesome. I mean, that was a little bit of a shot. Not that he doesn't deserve it, but there's not that many numbers retired. So it's it was a shocking in a I just wasn't expecting it way, not a, like a not deserving it way. I kind of was expecting it because after he signed the contract, they said, keep your eye on the Jumbotron during the game because we have another announcement. When when I heard that, I'm like, hmm, I wonder if that's going to involve banners and Hosa's name. And sure enough, sure enough, in all the glory, they showed the mock banner of what it's going to look like. Marion Hosa, number 81. Pretty cool. And also worth the price of admission. Justin Fields, our quarterback, did shoot the puck. And I assumed he would be doing the shoot the puck when I saw that he was there. So close to that time, I made my way over because he was literally directly across from me. And I was like, okay, I'm going to mosey my way over there. And sure enough, I saw him getting escorted. So I was eight feet away from him. Sean did his very best to try to go up and touch him. I was trying to be incognito. Like I may have well has just had a giant FICA bush and just been carrying it and walking behind it <laughs> on my tippy toes going. Doo, 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 doo. <laughs> I was the least incognito person. The only thing less incognito at that whole game was the the giant rush of water that was coming from the ceiling that shut down the escalator. And I didn't even know about that. Like, oh, honest man. to God, I didn't know about it. I mean, I walked around the entire, in between the first and second period, another friend of mine was there. I met up with her to talk about it. So I, I walked around the entire concourse and I was there very early because the Marion Hosa thing ended about 6.30, 6.35-ish. So there was still like an hour to go before puck drop. I, I didn't even know about that until afterwards. It was right outside of our section. So uh, my friend texts me and he's like, he went to go get his kid some food. And he's like, hey, come out here real quick. I just assumed that he needed help carrying stuff. So I go running out there because I was like, our seats were like, like when you come into the 200 section, it is uh, like the first seat to the left. Like when you mm-hmm. first walk in. So it's like, I'm on the end seat. So I'm like, all right, I jumped up, run over there. And he goes, go look. And I look over and I was like, holy cow. The <laughs> roof is just flooding water. <laughs> I was like, this building is a dump. <laughs> I just picture a scene like Titanic when the Grand Staircase Dome caves in. That happens the second you go right under it. <laughs> yeah, so then they had the uh, escalator shut down and they had like people at the top of it to prevent people from going down it, even though it wasn't running. And the water's just running onto the escalator. I'm sure that's not good for it. I don't, no. I'm, not a, I'm not an escalator repair man, but... I'm assuming gushing water and debris from the ceiling is not good. And then when we were leaving, they still had chunks of debris all over the place. Oh boy. Okay. So this actually brings up a question I wanted to ask you on tonight's show. This is a little conversation. Let's talk about the United center. I feel like the time has come where they might need to do some mass interior renovation to it because I don't know about you, but there, cause they're overall, I like the United center a lot. I think space wise it's, it's nice. And I think that there's some really nice amenities, but there are still some times I walk through some areas of that building and it feels very mid nineties to me. And I feel like the indoor could use a bit of a facelift. Oh, absolutely. I mean, from the outside, it looks fine. Right. And it's a weird, it's one of those weird buildings where it's like, we feel like it's too new to tear it down and put something new, but it's old enough where it probably needs some work. You know, Mm -hmm. how much work do you put into a building versus ride it out, ride it out and then just build a new one in a few years? I don't know the, the math behind that, but you're right. I mean, it sucks because I think the atrium was a cool addition with the giant store. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if it was executed the best way because, um, I I like it better. Like that game, they had it. So you couldn't enter from the outside. Mm -hmm. Um, so you didn't have to show your ticket to go back and forth. Right. Right. You'd having to show your ticket 
as you're you go out to go into the store and then show your ticket again to come back it just you know it's kind of annoying Mm -hmm. i agree Uh, so um yeah that's uh um you know but i i think there are things that you can do to to make that better um and hopefully hopefully that they can do that because you have two franchises playing in one of the top sports cities in in the country Mm -hmm. and they're not and you know i i would bet that the blackhawks are still in the top third of attendance and i'm sure the bulls are probably top five or six they're definitely top. I think they're one of the best attended teams in the league. So I mean, have, I, I think they're right. They they might be first because they have the highest seating capacity. Yeah, in so the NBA, you would think. Uh, you would think that, you know, those two teams could make it worthwhile to, to you know, up uh, upgrade a stadium. The problem is, you know, when do you do it? You you got to have it. I mean, you have to have it done during the off season. Luckily, the seasons overlap, but you know, you really got to find something that you can do fast enough to have it done before the season starts. Or, you know, you could do it like Wrigley Field. You could do it in phases. You focus on one thing, one off season, another thing, another off season. I I mean, if you were to ask my opinion on what they should do with the United Center, I don't think you need to completely gut the building, but I I think you can redo the concourses, like completely redo them because yeah, over the years, they've added like a few things here or there to the concourse. Like, oh, they'll put on some like acrylic paneling to cover some of the, the cinder block. Or, you know, they'll put in a little seating area that has uh, Corona all over it, like the Corona logos and the color scheme. It's like, OK, those are those are small things. I'm talking about like gutting the concourse itself and completely redoing it. The, the walls, the floors you know, maybe make it a little brighter too, because I feel like parts of the United Center concourse, I I don't know if you agree with this, but mainly the 300 level, I think is the biggest one where it's just a little dark, you know? Oh yeah. And I mean, they should, they should do things to alleviate all the congestion in the concessions and the bathrooms and make it a little more fan friendly. And, uh, you know, I totally agree with you. And I'm looking at the attendance numbers, the bulls for this current season, Finish the season number one in attendance in the NBA. There you go. Um, just ahead of the 76ers. And for this season, not over yet, but they've got a pretty comfortable cushion. Uh, they're going to be, the Blackhawks are going to be fifth in the NHL. Yeah. I After everything that's happened with how bad the team's been with all the other stuff, I, you know, it. they still draw. And I was, you know, the game the other night, you saw it, you were there. It, Thursday night, it was pretty well attended. You know, surprisingly, I mean, at first it was like, uh-oh, this is not looking so good. But then everyone started filing into their seats. And I was like, oh, hey, actually they did, um, you know, didn't do so bad. Yeah. And, yeah. and the attendance is down overall in the NHL. There's mm-hmm. no no team draws 20,000 people a game. Well, I still think the pandemic plays a role in that. Probably. And I also think, too, with just, you know, things being more expensive, people don't want to pay nearly as much now because, you know, think about it. You go to a game, you're paying more than just the ticket. You pay for parking. You know, if you're taking public transit there, you pay for that. If you want to get food, you pay for that. You know, it's, it's not as cheap as it once was. So I feel like those are all factors. And, you know, going back to kind of what I was saying about the United Center itself, I think in addition to the concourses, you could probably tear down the lower bowl, like the 100 level and kind of rebuild that. I feel like you don't need to tear down all the seating in like the second or third levels, but you know, I, you know, I'd say put in new seats themselves. I'm not saying demolish the actual bowls, but put in actual new seats. I feel like you can do that. I also feel like too, maybe you could maybe upgrade a little bit of, the ceiling. I know that sounds really weird, but you know, maybe with a new color scheme or, or just do a few things that makes a little more visually appealing. You know, I, I, again, overall, I like the experience at the United center, but I could definitely tell over the past two years, two, three years I've been going, 
you notice some of the warts are getting a little bigger on it, if that makes sense. Probably because the crowds are more sparse, so you get to see a little more sometimes. True. I mean, that, that is true. And the, the other thing, too, is you're seeing more and more new stadiums pop up over the past, what, five years, whether it's NHL, NBA, MLB, NFL. You're seeing new stadiums. The United Center was modern for a while, but compare that to some of the most modern arenas. It makes it look very outdated now. And then, you know, think about it, too. It's going to be almost 30 years old soon. Yeah, that's crazy to think that it's that old. Yeah, it's going to soon reach half the life of the old Chicago stadium. I mean, you know, you could always just tear it down and then play in a 5,000 seat arena like the uh, Coyotes. That's a great idea for the third largest market in the country. What a what a great idea. Hell, play at uh, play Bulls games at the DePaul Arena, though I got to say the DePaul Arena is actually really nice. It's nice, but I mean, what's the capacity on that? Nowhere near suitable for the NBA, that's for sure, especially for a team like the Bulls. Um, 10,300, so it's half of what it should be. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It exactly. would be cool, though, if they did like some exhibitions there or some preseason games. Sure. Yeah, that, that would be neat. I think you would definitely fill that space. Oh, yeah. In a heartbeat. You know, it's, it's things like that make it cool. Be like, like if they did a Bears preseason game at Wrigley Field or something like, oh, that'd be amazing. You know, do something to make people want to come to the preseason games. Well, you know, it was always my dream. I know they'll never do this because of the capacity to see them do a throwback Bears game at Wrigley Field. I think that'd be the coolest thing ever. And the way I could justify it is, yeah, you may not sell as much seats, but think about the television ratings. I mean, isn't most of the revenue in television media anyway these days? I mean, you know, you could you could do it. I mean, um, yeah. in the preseason, you can't do it in a regular season game, but a preseason game, you could totally do that. They there's should. so many, there's so many, you know, there's so many empty seats anyway. You, I, I, like, I take my kid because she loves to go, but I'm not going to take her when it's cold no. or when the games are a hundred dollars a ticket. I take her when I can get $10 preseason tickets and she doesn't know the difference she gets. They give a giveaway. So she gets a bobblehead. She gets to get some candy and popcorn or whatever. She sits there for a while, and then if she gets tired, we go home. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's preseason. We take. I mean, I remember going as a kid. So it doesn't cost. Yeah, it doesn't cost anything to park because we just ride the L. So it's you know ten dollars total to ride the L for the two of us. It's and it's you know for like forty bucks she is a pig and shit. I'm like, there we go. (laughs) I yeah. I mean, when I was a kid. My uh, dad's coworker had Bears season tickets and he didn't really want to go to the preseason game. So he just gave them to us and we always had a good time. I was at Jay Cutler's first ever game as a bear, like preseason. It was against the Giants. First time we ever saw him at Soldier Field. I remember being there for that. It, it was really, really cool. You, uh, we had The seats were right in the south end zone. Like not the first section, but like the section above it that goes back probably about halfway up. So they were pretty solid seats. You know, I couldn't complain about them. And that's the nice thing. One of the nice things about, say, the United Center is that there isn't a bad seat in the house. So if you were to renovate uh, the United Center, you could keep that same layout and be fine, I feel like. Um, what my daughter did get a kick out of at the bears games was when they call a timeout and the announcer goes, there's a timeout. And then everybody in the crowd yells where, and then they go on the field. Oh, Mm -hmm. and by the time she heard it a couple of times, she was so into it and cracking herself up. That's hilarious. (laughs) But I was the same way too. when I heard that it's so funny. So yeah, we'll be doing that again this this year. We didn't do it last year. Um, why did we? Hmm, I'm trying to remember. Did we do it last year? 
Last year, I wasn't at preseason, but my buddy and I went to the family festival. Yeah, I missed the family festival. That was weird because the weird thing about that was it was during the day on a weekday. But yeah. it was when it was after the layoff and before I got my new job. So I'm like, man, I'm getting paid to do nothing. Let's go to the Bears, you know, preseason family festival. It was fun. It was a beautiful day. We had seats right next to the Bears tunnel. It, it was it was a good time. Uh, so should we talk baseball? Cause we've got the season here and we are a whole series in and we've got the Cubs and the white Sox both with winning records already. Yeah. And I could talk about the other game I saw that was a loss. <laughs> um, so are the Cubs good? No, but I think they're better than people think. I don't know. <clears throat> if they'll be able to continue doing what they did against the Brewers for the whole season. But I saw things I liked. Me too. Like it, it is a very, very small sample size, but Seiya Suzuki is a really good hitter. Yeah. And I feel like we could talk about the way he hits the ball, but the real conversation I think people should have first is how he sees the ball. Yep. I think they said he faced uh, 28 pitches outside the zone. He did not, he didn't swing at 26 of them. And uh, one got called the strike. I don't know. It's, it's, he, he was, his eye was so good. He just wasn't swinging at things outside, which would be my concern with him because as they try to figure him out, you know, probably the next thing they'll do is, is throwing some, some eye level pitches and see if he swings on things up, but it seems like his eye is very good. So you're going to have to get him out with stuff. And some of those pitches too, if you go back and watch them, it's not like they were way outside or way higher in the dirt. There were some really close ones that, you know, a lot of people would swing at. And that home run he hit, did you see what the exit velocity on that was? No, but seeing it in person, I could tell you it was a lot. It was just shy of 111 miles an hour. I could tell you the second it left the bat, I knew it was gone. Everybody and their mother knew it was gone. I'm going to tell you something. Do you know when the last time Chris Bryant hit a baseball with that same exit velocity or high? 20... I'm going to guess something crazy like 2016. It was May 6, 2019. Okay. So not that bad, but still a while. Hmm. And uh, uh, Dan Bernstein today was quoting a guy from, I think, Baseball Prospectus who said, Seiya Suzuki is um, an upgrade over Chris Bryant. Ooh, bold. Um, And so it's not a guy that's just making a statement like, this is a guy that's using numbers and I'm sure he's, he's using a lot of the data that he got, you know, from his time playing in Japan, but uh, still like the guy's approach at the plate. Sure. Everybody's going to hit a slump at some point, but the guy's eye and it's not just power like uh, Patrick wisdom, where he's got to hit a home run to get out of that. He really, he's just a, he's, he's, uh, the guy we thought we were getting with Jason Hayward, except more power. Right. Where he is just making solid contact, good contact, um, just more power. I mean, the guy won a batting title and a home run or, or like a home run race in Japan and a goal, their version of gold glove. So it's, he's a good, he's a good all around baseball player. He's so got I'm all very the tools. Happy um, we Nico Horner looks like he was ready to play. Yeah. He's made some solid contact. Even yesterday he lined out with runners on that, you know, could have been a difference if it fell in, but even though it wasn't out, he struck it pretty well. Yeah. Um, just all around the Cubs approach at the plate, scoring runs, not necessarily with the home run making contact. They went against three, all-star level pitchers first three games. And if it wasn't for a bad Jesse Chavez inning, they could have very well been three and zero. Yep. 
And yep. so you're like, okay, I like the approach. Um, the one person that was a little frustrating was actually Nick Madrigal. Yeah. Yeah. I think his timing is still a little off. I think he's still trying to get into the groove and I mean, he's still kind of doing what he does. He's making contact. He did line out a few times, but you know, there were other times where he was just hitting weak tappers. And I think Ron Coomer said this, that he could just tell his timing is still a little off. So I'm not going to pile on him too much yet, but Nick Madrigal is the kind of guy where if he's not dinking and dunking and getting on base via the hit, you're not going to get much else out of it. Just, I didn't think about it until the, the series, but because he's a contact guy and he's a grounder guy, we're probably going to have to live with double plays. Well, I just, that, that's, I want him either batting lead off or batting down. I don't think him batting in the two holes, the best spot for him. Agreed. Agreed. I mean, do we have a leadoff guy? Probably not. Ortega is fine. Um, I've actually been pretty impressed with Ortega. His his eye at the plate has been good too. I, I'm talking more of a overall. I mean, he was great the series, mm-hmm. but overall, like he's 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 been fine. Like I, you know, you're you're not at this point going to upgrade over him. Um, so he's been he's been good. Uh, Jan Gomes looked good. We got to talk about Ian Happ. The getting hit. And I just, what he's done so far. Oh yeah. I mean, if we can get him to carry over what he did second half of last season, the entire year. I just, we need Ian Happ to be consistently good because every season we've seen the mix of the really good and the really bad when he's on, he's on, but boy, when he is off, he is off by a mile. True. True. Um, but, uh, I mean, he's, he's crushing the ball right now. I mean, he's got a 1800 OPS. I mean, granted yeah. it's two games, um, small sample size. Yeah. Oh, obviously. But I mean, the, just the approach, he looks good. It's not fluke. So that's, that's big. Um, you know, Jason Hayward has looked competent. Still don't want him starting every day. I, I agree. I agree. I watched Alfonso Rivas yesterday. He needs to get more playing time. Alfonso Rivas needs more playing time. There's um, there's one thing I want to express before I forget. I, I think we're going to see some major regression from Schwindel and Wisdom this year. Um. I mean, you're definitely going to see regression from Frank Schwindel, but I don't think it's going to be that terrible. He's a good baseball player. Um, you're not going to see what he did last year. He was he was awesome. Patrick Wisdom. I mean, why couldn't he repeat that? I mean, the guy's just. I mean, the wind is the only thing going to keep him from not hitting home runs. Is that guy? That guy's just, you know, an ogre. He makes contact, and you're just like, bazow. When he makes contact, right. It's going to be, does he strike out 40% of the time? Probably. But even so who, you know, having that power in the bat in the lineup, when the lineup isn't strike out all up and down the lineup, it's, it's, you can absorb that. If he can still hit the home runs, I'm perfectly fine with it. But if he's not hitting home runs, then you're not going to get much of anything. Agreed. Okay. And I just, how many good pitches is he going to get to hit? I mean, if you've got guys working the count and you have starting pitchers burning 45, 50 pitches in the first inning, uh, yeah, he's going to see something. Well, you hope. I, you know, Frank Schwindel, I hope he turns it around. And, and Patrick Wisdom, I hope he can do what he did last year too. I'm really rooting hard for those guys. I just don't know how much we can rely on them. I just, I, I don't know if Frank Schwindel can be like, if you, if he gives you like a two sixty average and like 20 Homer season, perfectly fine with me. I think that's reasonable. Let me I ask you a question. Yes. 
let's say that Frank Schwindel and Patrick Wisdom turn out to be not the guys we'd hoped they would be. What's worst case scenario? Eh, you, you, you just move on. Yeah, we are not financially tied to them. No, we can easily move on from them. I mm-hmm. think this is the perfect year. We have low expectations. Mm-hmm. Um, we're in a weak division, mm-hmm. and you, you, you know, you clearly have glaring holes. And I think you're gearing up for guys to come up. So why not give them as many at bats as you can and see what you have? Because oh, if, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah, if 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 you give both guys the vast majority of the starts, and you go, okay, you know what? We've seen enough not working. Okay, no harm, no foul. You know, you this was kind of a lost season anyway. But if they turn out to be at what you had hoped or close to it, then it changes the calculus of what you do next year. You're like, okay, well, you know what? We could actually rely on these guys. Uh, or, you know, we could platoon them. We have other things we can do. We don't, we're not stuck going crap. We got to replace first and third. Yeah. I, you know, I, I just hope that that can happen. I really do. And I'm not saying it can't, I'm just a tad worried. It won't, you know, it, I know it's too small to judge, but some of the Schwindel at bats yesterday and so far we've seen have been pretty ugly. You know, opening day, 3 0, swung, hit a double play. Yesterday, struck out on some breaking and off speed stuff. You just hope it was a bad series. It, but, you know, if, if, these, if these guys were 22, 23, I wouldn't be as worried. But considering they were such late bloomers and you knew they were kind of playing at a, I guess you could say, unsustainable pace last year at times, you just worry a little bit. But we'll see what happens. We'll see. Yeah, I'm not terribly concerned about it. I have the same, I have the same concerns. I'm just not that worried about it. Because if they both, if they both end up stinking, okay, then, you know you add it to the list of things, positions you need to upgrade next year. And it's not like, it's not like we didn't already know we needed to upgrade a lot of positions. So it's more of a tryout this year. Last year, you got an opportunity and um, out of necessity this year, you're getting the full season opportunity and let's see what you do with it. And both guys, both guys are, you know, given the shot and Patrick wisdom crushed one and they, did you see the calculation? They said the wind carried it in 18 feet and it was caught on the warning track. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like that, that was such a home run in if the wind wasn't directly blowing in. Oh, for sure. For sure. So, I mean, that guy's just got raw power and it's, you can't teach that. And if, just as long as he makes solid contact. Um, and I guess that's sort of the issue too, but you know, he's going to get his strikeouts, but if he can get those strikeouts down to 33% and he keeps the home run. I mean, that home run pace he was on last year was unreal. Yeah, it was. What was it? it? Was. Every, every 15 at bats or something ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, think about it. He had 28 in less than like 120 games. So, um, so, I mean, his home run pace was, was, uh, ridiculous. Um, so, you, you know, he's not going to hit that same number extrapolated out to 162 games, but he's going to hit home runs. Let's see, 338 at bats and hmm, baseball reference. Uh-uh. 338 at bats and 28 home runs. Every t- little over 12 at bats. Yeah, I mean, especially early on, he was hitting like multi homers a game. So 12, every 12.07 at bats, he hits home run. So, I mean, if you extrapolate that to 500. Oops. Um, 500 at bats. That's, that's 41 home runs. 
that's a lot of home runs to expect. If he hits, if he hits 30 home runs, 32 home runs, 35 home runs. Um, I'd be happy with 20 plus, honestly. I mean, I mean, is it unreal for him to get 550 at bats? I mean, we'll see. I mean, that case, depends on what happens this year. In that case, he'd be on pace to have 46 home runs. Yeah, I don't think that's happening. I mean, Jorge Soler proved me wrong. And, you know, that guy crushed a bunch of home runs, even though he's a similar guy to Patrick Wisdom. Yeah, I just, uh, I, I'm not, I just got think it's it. going to happen. I'm just saying is stranger I, things have happened. Cause, cause you, know, you know, who else was on a ridiculous tear at one point was Brian LaHare. You remember Brian LaHare. I do remember Brian LaHare. So, but it, I'm rooting the hell for him. I want him to, I want him to succeed. Don't get me wrong. I just, I, I just feel like we have to be careful with these types of, uh, these types of players. And we have to, we have to look at our expectations and, you know, not, not necessarily be fully down on them, but, you know, give some wiggle room to, you know, maybe allow for things to fall more than you desire just because of the circumstances, but we'll see, we'll see. And so, um, you know, we got good pitching performances. Justin Steele pitched great. Yeah. Good for him. Yeah. I missed that game. I was at a wedding, but I, I saw the highlights. I saw what he did really locked in, made me really happy to see Kyle Hendricks have a good game. Stroman had a great game. Uh, Hendricks had a great game. Yep. Um, it was fun being there with Stroman. The crowd was really into it. Um, so, you know, you've seen great pitching and I know that's probably not that sustainable either. Uh, but we did see what Smiley can do tomorrow against Jose Quintana, number four pitcher for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Mm-hmm. So that means he's going to throw a no hitter, right? Oh, of course. You, you know, you, you know that they're, he's going to get, he's going to own the Cubs. You, you just, you know that. Um, uh, you know who else is on the Pirates too, right? Dwayne Underwood Jr. Okay. He's been, I know he's been there a little bit, but <laughs> uh, I just for, completely forgot about that name. Well, remember, there was a time where we thought we were, he was a pretty solid pitching prospect for the Cubs. Um, I know. And then he just pooped the bed. I also feel like, too, he didn't really when he was coming up to the system, he didn't really have much of a spot on the team. So it was just hard for him to develop. But. Whatever. Anyway, yeah, yeah so, Jose Quintana. Woo-hoo. Um, so, you know, it should be a less. I mean, you know, I say that, but then they could go and, and get shit on by the Pirates. But um, it should be a an easier series than the the Brewers because on paper the Pirates are terrible. Yeah, but is, you know how annoying the Pirates are when the Cubs have to play them in that ballpark. You know, I I've, feel like the I feel like the Cubs play really frustrating baseball at PNC Park. Um that's what they do. They just play shitty baseball there. But it's only Unless two games. It's a wild card. Yeah. It's a uh, um, it's only a two game series, so it'd be nice to get the sweep on that. Absolutely. Um, on the other side of town, <clears throat> uh, you know, really, there's two things that could potentially hold this team back. Do you know what they are? Starting pitching injuries, and I'll give you a hint: glug, 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 glug. <laughs> And Tony La Russa. And Tony La Russa. <laughs> glug, glug, glug. <laughs> uh, he, he takes to his glug, 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 like uh, a certain favorite pitcher of ours takes to the chaw. Yeah, I mean, they, they took the, the L on the first game. But, Brutal game. Brutal. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, uh, but... Man, 
that team can score some runs. Honestly, if Luis Roberts healthy, that team's going to go far. That's just how I feel. Even with all the issues, if he's healthy, they're going to be fine with him hitting up there and then getting Tim Anderson back who went three for five in the finale swung at the first pitch, hit a double. He wasn't waiting around. You like Tim Anderson being aggressive that way. He just, he finds the right pitch. And if he sees one early on, he'll swing and hit it. If that's the top of your order, I don't see them losing a lot of ball games. Yeah, there's going to be some frustrating games. Yeah, you're going to have to win some shootouts if you've got guys like Giolito hurt or Lance Lynn hurt, which, I mean, the injuries are, again, they're, they're just piling up for the White Sox. You have Giolito's going to miss some time with the side, and he was absolutely rolling in the first game. I mean, he was looking like a legitimate ace. Everything was working. All those pitches, changing the eye level, the movement, it all looked fantastic. Um, and then, you know, obviously Lance Lynn's going to miss some time, but they could score runs to win games if that, that lineup continues to be healthy. And that Aaron Bummer and and uh, Liam Hendricks don't blow that many games. And it took it took the two of them to do that. Um, yeah, I wouldn't hit the panic button on Hendricks just yet. It, it, it was a bad performance, but it, it's one. And if I remember correctly, didn't Hendricks kind of struggle to start last year, too? And then he kind of came around. I don't remember. I, he struggled at one point, but I don't remember. I think it was might have been early. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. But, you know, you end up getting a uh, AJ Pollock who, I mean, we all knew he was going to hit the ball well when he was healthy. And that's what he came in and did hit the ball. And he's not healthy right now. I don't think he's going to be out that long, but I don't think uh, so either. But you get Tim Anderson back, who was on the two game suspension to open the season, which was dumb. Like baseball just loves to shoot themselves in the foot. Uh, but he just comes in and he is the engine that drives that offense. I agree with you that Luis Robert is the best player on that team. Mm-hmm. But Tim Anderson is the engine. Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't have called uh, uh, Fowler the, the best hitter on the Cubs when they won the World Series, but they he was he was that engine. You go, we go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's what Tim Anderson is. And yeah, he's he's an exceptional uh, spark plug. And Luis Robert looks good. Um, Jose Abreu looks good. Uh, Vaughn already two home runs in this out of in three games. Yeah, I don't think the Sox want to trade him. What in the world? I, I Did you see the report that Oakland has interest in trading for him? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it just... <clears throat> I, the Sox don't want to give up Vaughn and I don't think the A's are going to give up Montas for a small price. So like who, who would you trade Vaughn for? Like, what would you expect him to get to part ways with him considering the, how many years of control you still have on him in, in terms of specific players? No, just not, not specific, but like, what type of player like, oh, you'd have to get um, a front end pitcher with, you know, X number of years. Yeah. Or... Yeah. I, I, yeah. I'd say, a, I'd say a top tier ace or number two with control. Plus maybe another throw in like a, a reliever or like some player to be named later. But yeah, I mean, the main piece would want to be a front end starter with multiple years of control. Certainly not a rental. Um, but the cub, uh, we're what four days into the season and the white Sox and Cubs already have a day off on the same day. Yeah. Isn't that weird? Um, but the home opener for the white Sox is tomorrow. And have you seen who the starter will be? Is it that guy from the Phillies? Um, Velasquez, is that his name? You're talking about the start for the White Sox, right? Hello? Oh, I'm sorry. I hit mute. Um, yeah, you're right. Nice going. <laughs> Vin- Vince Velasquez. Silence. 
Vince Velasquez will be starting the home opener for the Chicago White Sox. Yeah. On what planet do you expect a World Series contender to have Vince Velasquez be the opening day or the home opener starter? Why? Why? Well, who else? Who else do they have? Dallas Keuchel. I mean, at least he gives you hope that he's going to be good. Mm. That, Vince Velasquez goes, you go out there and you go, oh, Velasquez is pitching. Hopefully we score 10. Mm. But also, I mean, they'll probably score 10. But also, why in the world? I, I can't even like bang on Rick Hahn about this because this is clearly ownership not opening the purse strings. But why in the world do you go into the season with like, we have just enough starting pitching. So everything has to be perfect. You're like, if it's not, you're rolling with Reynaldo Lopez. And if two things go wrong, you are rolling with Vince Velasquez. That's not where you want to be. You should have brought in another starter. Hey, they brought in Johnny Cueto. Who what probably won't pitch for another few weeks, but what is he? 38. He's like 36. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I don't know. I know some people are kind of optimistic about Johnny Cueto, but I'm not so sure. Is it, I don't think he's, is it his grandma? No, it, it's actually fans, but I don't know. He's got Matt Latos written all over him. Yeah. A few years ago would be a hell of a pickup, but. I don't think he's pitched more than like 20 games in like, I know he pitched like a decent amount last year, but other than that, he hasn't pitched like a full season in years. He was seven and seven with a, a 4.08 ERA last year, the year before two and three with a 5.4 the year before that one and two with a 5.06 three and two with a 3.23 eight and eight with a 4.52. And 2016 was the last time he was good. Yeah, it, it's been a hot minute. I, I mean, I know you had to get something, but yeah, I, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how it does. If if he can just eat innings, I feel like that's a win for the Sox, wouldn't you say? Because again, your offense is going to score. I mean, I, I still think think despite the pitching at least for now for the time being if this were the case in October or September yeah I'd be pretty worried but right now early in the season you're going to score runs you're going to win games no matter what you just got to get that pitching staff healthy I mean you know he uh he 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 pitched 114 innings last year and 21 starts so it's a little less than five and a half innings per start yeah well We'll see how he warms up. You know, he's still got to go through, what, a few weeks to kind of ramp up because he didn't really have a spring training, obviously. He signed, like, I think it was last week, early last week. So he's got he's got some conditioning and getting in shape to do before he, he reaches the majors again. He's going to have to probably start with the Charlotte Knights and then work his way up. Zips projections. Have him at a 4.48 ERA with a 1.33 whip. Honestly, if you got that out of him, I feel like that wouldn't be the worst at this point in his career. I mean, none of these projections look terrible. They don't look good, but they don't look terrible. They keep you with your offense. It keeps you in a game. Yeah, Um, you're right. Especially until you get essentially until you get your healthy team back. You're just trying not to tax your bullpen right right um but all of the projections have them either at 500 record wise or one game under so i mean i know wins and losses don't really matter but if you're if you're winning half the games you're pitching even if it's the offense driving you with two starting pitchers out you take that um you know the not the best of whips but the strikeout numbers look good that they project they all project 
project somewhere in the seventies with under 30 strikeouts. And in the 1.3, 1.4 whip range, I, I, I think you could have done worse. No, absolutely. I mean, I know that the, the pickings were kind of slim, but he was the best free agent available. Yeah. Um, but this White Sox team is going to be exciting. And I, you know, going back to the Andrew Vaughn thing, I, I don't know if I part ways with him. I feel like unless you can just absolutely rip somebody off, which I don't think will happen, I think he is more important to your roster for his versatility and his bat than whatever you're going to get for him. Mm-hmm. No, I so agree. I think he's more important to your win now status. Um, doesn't mean you can't trade him a couple of years down the road, but I think he's too important for you this year and you reevaluate next year. I'm right there with you. Um, I had one more thing for the White Sox, and that is you saw them DFA uh, Mick or Adolfo, and I was like, oh, they're going to lose him. He cleared waivers, came back. Yeah, so you still got him. How the hell did nobody pick him up? I'm not saying he's a superstar, but I mean, doesn't he show you enough that that if you're a terrible team, you take a flyer on him? I not like he makes somebody would. I figured figured. somebody would too. Yeah. So that was that was shocking. I was assuming he was gone. Um, I was reading on uh, MLB trade rumors, and the the uh, the fan replies seemed to agree that. You know, up oh, he's gone. Somebody's gonna pick him up. And I was I was dumbfounded when I saw that he wasn't. Gary texted me the, the article. I was like, oh shit. I was like, that's that's great news. Like I I thought they were gonna lose him, and I think they probably were expecting to lose him. Yeah. I think a lot of people were too. I think the White Sox were prepared to say goodbye and then nobody wanted him. So it's like, well, we'll keep you. So that's that's good for them. Um, but I, I'm excited to see where, where, uh, the, the Cubs go going forward. I think it would take a whole lot of things to go right at the same time for them to be good. Whereas the white Sox, it would take a whole lot of the equal number of things to go wrong for them to not be good. Yeah. Um, and I mean, with everything that's gone wrong, things are just going to go right because of how talented they are. Yeah. The Cubs are going to, they're going to hit a rough patch. And with a lot of newer bats on there, it's going to be interesting to see how they respond to those. But I like the attitude they have. Um, I like that there's already a bond between uh, Ian Happ and say a Suzuki. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if you saw, but say a Suzuki was telling people that Ian Happ is his best friend. And I like to see that. You know, already already makes awesome. Um, it's awesome. It seems like that they fit right in perfectly. Say Suzuki's part of the team and they embrace him. He embraces them. And, you know, that's not easy for someone coming over, you know, from overseas. And that doesn't speak the language. He has an interpreter. Right. Exactly. That, you know, that's, that's gotta be a challenge, but everything is going so well so far. You love to see it. Yeah. I mean, I like the camaraderie. Uh, I, I saw that they were mic'd up the other day. Patrick Wisdom and Nick Madrigal were throwing warm up <clears throat> um, across the the infield for a game, and they had a Madrigal mic'd up. And it's number one, it's hilarious to just look at the size comparison between those two. I don't know if Patrick Wisdom's that tall, but he's just like build wise, he is just a monster compared to to Madrigal. Like he's got those Popeye forearms. But uh, Nick Madrigal is like, well, what do you consider pop music? Like, like uh, Justin Bieber, and and Patrick Wisdom's like, I guess. And he goes, mm, I think I'll stick with country. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I do, I do like the approach that they've had at the plate so far for the Cubs. I really do. It's gonna make it. Um, 
you know, last the last several years, we have all bitched and moaned about how everything was feast or famine and how many shows have we come in and, you know, 75% of the Cubs games during the, the last week, you know, we came on our show were games where they scored all of their runs or almost all of their runs on the home run ball. It's not sustainable. Um, unless you're like this year's blue Jays, they're going to hit 400 home runs as a team. Uh, yeah, that team is something. The blue Jays, whew, they're going to pound some home runs. Like I I'm, I'm hoping the blue Jays win that division. Yeah, me too. Me Just too. I tired of the rays and the Yankees and the, the Red Sox. Imagine being in a world where you're saying we're tired of the Rays. Isn't that crazy? You know, I have no reason to be tired of them. <clears throat> Just want somebody different. Um, no, I get it. I get it. But I, I do like this approach where you've got some guys that can smash the ball and hit a home run, um, including the new bulked up Nico Horner. Uh, whoever had Nico Horner hitting the first Cubs home run of the year, step forward for your prize. Because it definitely wasn't me. You're, you're going to be like, you're going to be that guy who has Nico Horner, just everything all over your house. <laughs> now I'm not, a, I'm not a Nico Horner stand, but I was, I was, he did look like he bulked up a little bit in the off season. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I'd heard that before. I think Dan Bernstein said his son saw him <clears throat> at the place he practices at taking batting practice. And he's like, yeah, he looks like, like a linebacker he's bulked up and i was like oh i wonder if he was able to turn that into actual like applicable strength and not just gym strength but i mean so far got a home run I like that <clears throat> i'd rather have him stay healthy though than than drive up the power numbers too much right yep um but i'm just excited to have baseball back me too it feels great i love scoreboard watching i love watching all the highlights it's it's great um, so do you want to talk bulls or do you want to talk bears? Well, we talk bulls, we got playoffs coming and, uh, I don't think it's going to be here to stay very long. Yeah. So, you know, as we started getting down to it, um, we, uh, it, it was looking like we were going to play 76ers or the Celtics or the, uh, the Milwaukee Bucks in the playoffs, and I, mean, I guess the the Celtics was probably your the one you'd probably like to play the most because um, with injuries you feel like you could at least kind of match up with them, even though they just blow, blew you out last time they played you. But this Bulls team has just been trending the wrong direction. They're not just losing; they're getting embarrassed. Oh yeah, I mean, I didn't see it live because I was at a friend's house, but. Briefly following at certain points, what was going on against who was it at home? Was it Charlotte? They were playing. Was it the Charlotte Hornets? Yeah. Or I mean that that's embarrassing. You should be laughed out of the damn building. And I'm not going to go on a full analysis of this yet. I don't want to sound too overreactionary, but there is some clear turning on Billy Donovan. You could see from the fan base. I mean, I don't know how much of this is on him, but the problem is, is you don't have any interior defense. No. And it without a healthy Lonzo ball and without a healthy Alex Caruso, the reason that you were able to at least have semblance of interior defense is they clogged the passing lanes. And so they made it hard to get to, to move it down. But with the other bulls guards, you just, you have no, there's nobody to stop you from passing down to the post. And then once you're down there, it's Vooch is like, might as well be dunking on like a third grader. It's just, you're going to, you're going to score. And, uh, it's, it's bad. And Giannis is going to eat them alive. And you looked at the bucks and they were like, all right, DeMar score 50. We don't care. Right. We're going to win anyway. And you know what? The Bucks weren't even playing a hundred percent. They were just kind of lollygagging. Yeah, and, and they, they still, still beat us. Destroyed you. Yeah, I th- I think it's going to be an absolute bloodbath. 
I, I mean, I, it's, it's going to be, be embarrassing. It's yeah. going to be a sweep. Um, you know what though? What if? Do you remember the the year that the Bulls played the Celtics in the the, the playoffs? And everyone two thousand nine, mm-hmm. and every game went to like overtime or double overtime, <clears throat> except I for the that one. Very well. I went to one game in that series. It was the one where the Bulls got blown out. Of and, course. And Gary had season tickets at that time. And he was just like, I'm never bringing you again. This is your fault. It's like, sorry, man, I'm a jinx. And every other game was just like this awesome, you know, multiple overtime game. So we would have won that series if it wasn't for Sean Hopman. That's yes, good to know. I ruined everything. God, God idiot. But I don't I can't see, talk. I don't see that happening this year. I, I just the the Bucks are a good team. The Bulls are not. Maybe they surprise you and and take a game. But I, this is this is not going to be a series. No Lonzo Ball, a hurt Zach Levine, and Alex Caruso who isn't one hundred percent. Yeah, and I just you can't play defense. Vooch can't play defense. I love Io. I'm not saying he's bad, but let's be. He has know, hit the rookie wall hard. He, yes, he has. Yes, he has. And Kobe White just forgot how to play. Yeah, he did. Um, do you remember? This must have been uh, 2000 one ish, 2000, when Allen Iverson and the 76ers were in the NBA Finals against. Uh, Shaq and Kobe in the magic in the uh, the magic, the Lakers. Uh, I was like in second grade, first grade. So, well, that was a team that was essentially Allen Iverson, the corpse of Dikembe Mutombo. And, and then they MacGyvered the thing together with the rest of a roster. And they, this was, this was Dikembe when he couldn't go off the ground, he just put his arm up and waved, uh, Maybe in my house sometimes, um, but and then you were p- facing the juggernaut, and Allen Iverson came out that first game and just attacked, attacked, and attacked, and they totally caught the Lakers off guard in one game one, and then they got smashed after that. Yeah, but I feel like maybe something like that could happen. Is the Bulls just change things up, catch them off guard, and just steal one game but i i just i can't see them even contending in the series unfortunately i'd be happy if they won a game i'm not even expecting it but i'd be happy if they won i please prove me wrong you know we we won't know officially what happens until it happens but i'm just not counting on anything right now i'm just not milwaukee's too good we have too many issues i this is the last team I wanted to play truly. And there was never going to be a good matchup for the bulls, but it's just another chapter of Wisconsin taking down Chicago yet again. I didn't want to play the 76ers just because I lived in Philly. That's fair. And and I think uh, Joel Embiid would just, just destroy them. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it would be embarrassing. Think about what Giannis is going to do to you. Multiply that by two with Joel Embiid. Yeah. Um, Because Giannis is not going to live down the paint like that. So it's just, I just didn't want to see that because the Sixers are hungry. This is, this is like one, they have an opportunity now to, to show everybody that the process worked after 400 years. Um, So I think they're hungry. Um, So I, I don't want to face them. They, they're a bad matchup for you. Yeah, but, that's fair. But it, I'm not saying that the Celtics were a good matchup or the, the Bucks are a good matchup or the Heat were a good matchup. Um, if you wanted to win a game, your best bet was probably to to not get your best bet was probably to go into the uh the play in series. Cause then you'd be like, oh, maybe I could beat one of these teams. Yeah, well. I didn't want to play in the play in series. You know, I mean, it's it's funny. If you'd have told me at the beginning of the season, hell, in the summer, that the Bulls would make the playoffs as a six seed, I'd be really happy. Wouldn't you? Oh, absolutely. We got 
we got fooled into thinking this team was better than they were. And they were just playing really well. I think teams figured them out a little bit. They came back down to earth. And um, so it's just just a wrong time. Yep. Um, but I think the Nets beat the Cavs to play the Celtics. And then I guess I really don't care who wins the other play-in game to play the Heat. Because the Heat are going to probably smash whoever. Probably, probably. Uh, all right, should we talk talk a little because they haven't announced the uh, the playoff schedule yet. I haven't seen. I know the playoff starts Sunday, so those are the well, playoff game or the play in games first, I believe. Yeah, yeah, which obviously makes sense. So we'll see. We'll see how it all lays out. Um. So I guess we wrap this up talking a little Bears. Uh, the Bears have been pretty quiet still we signed a special teamer slash backup linebacker who played for a couple years with matt eberflus so that's that's more of a a backup role you know might even make the roster if if you draft well uh and so i started looking at the roster and they slowly but surely have been filling out the roster i mean remember before a couple weeks ago where i was like they don't have even enough wide receivers. They don't have enough, you know, cornerbacks to field the roster. They're slowly but surely f- f- being able to field the roster. Is it a roster that could be improved? Oh, absolutely. But you at least are starting to have enough bodies where you're like, okay, I can see this being the team. Um. So as it stands now, I think Cairo Santos and Patrick Scales are locks in this team. You know, you got your long snapper and you got your your kicker. Right now, Ryan Winslow is your punter. I'm assuming they're going to bring in competition and have a kickoff, but I don't really care. It won't be like the kickoff of 2019 between kickers. No, it's going to be a punter. Um, they might even, you know, that 186 pick, they might even draft a punter. Maybe. If somebody, if somebody good's still available. Yeah. Um, at that at that level, you know, it's it's not a bad investment if you feel like they're going to be good. Right. Yeah. No kidding. I do have to say they signed that guy from the Ravens who I'm very intrigued with. Yeah. Uh, Tavon Young. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I was going to talk about that. Uh, so right now um, they've got enough. They've got more than enough cornerbacks. So I think my the way I broke this down was I thought they would keep six cornerbacks, four safeties, six linebackers, four defensive ends, five defensive tackles. And that Sam, excuse me, that Sam linebacker is going to be able to alternate in sometimes as a defensive end, I think in certain situations, passing situations. Um, But uh, uh, they, right now they've got two, four, six, eight cornerbacks on the roster. They've got Jalon Johnson, Kendall, Kendall Vildor, Tavon Young is going to be your, your nickel, um, your slot corner, your nickel. Um, Thomas Graham, Lamar Jackson, Duke Shelley, Michael Joseph, and Bo Pete Keys. Tavon Young is really good if he's healthy. If he stays yes. healthy, this is an absolute steal. Yes. Yeah, it's a one-year deal, very cheap. With a Every maximum Raven- value of $1.7 million. Yeah, I, that is an absolute deal. And, you know, I saw a tweet talking about him signing with the bears and several bears fans asked on the tweet and the replies saying, Hey, Ravens fans, what can you tell me about him? And they all said glowing things about him. So if he's healthy, you might be looking at one of the defensive steals of free agency. He is essentially when the bears were good. He was, he's essentially Bryce Callahan. Mm-hmm. Um, and if he stays healthy, just like Bryce Callahan. Mm-hmm. So if we, we get him healthy, that is going to be a steal. And if, um, you know, I, I still think corner is a spot that you need to shore up. I don't, uh, sh- I'm fine giving Thomas Graham an opportunity to win the spot, but I don't think at this point, Thomas Graham or Kendall Vildor are going to be your starters. And the other guys are all just backups. So I think you need to add another corner, whether that is in, 
the the draft or that last wave of free agency, which there are still guys. Yeah. Um, safety right now, you've got three on your roster. So there you you probably you're you're gonna need to pick up another one unless they're planning to convert one of the corners to safety. We got Eddie Jackson, Dane Crookshank, and uh DeAndre Houston Carson, who I'm fine with all three of those. It'd be nice to add another box safety. But um that's fine. Uh your linebackers right now, your starting three are probably I'm gonna guess Roquan Smith is your middle linebacker, your Mike, Nicholas Morrow is your Will, and Caleb Johnson is your Sam. <clears throat> and your backup three are Joe Thomas, Matthew Adams. Ladarius Mack, I think they're going to move him to Sam linebacker and Noah Dawkins. Your your edge rushers, your defensive ends, Travis Gibson, Robert Quinn, Jeremiah Tachu, <clears throat> Al Kadeen, Muhammad, Charles Snowden, and Sam Kamara. So I think you're actually okay with pass rushing. Um, I think you're going to see a marked improvement from Charles Snowden, and that's what I'm hoping for. Um. And I would not be surprised if they moved him to Sam linebacker because he's really athletic. And your defensive tackles are Kyrus Tonga and Justin Jones and Angelo Blacks and Mario Edwards Jr. So LaCale London and Azaya Alufahai, who they picked up this off or the as a futures contract. Um could they beef up their defensive line? Probably. Do they need linebacker help? Probably safety help, definitely cornerback help, definitely. Um, you know, there's there's actually some free agent cornerbacks that I think are could be all right. Uh, Steven Nelson, um, I, I only put guys that uh are under 30 and that are still available. So you've got Steven Nelson, Kevin King from the Packers last season, Trey Waynes, and Vernon Hargraves. Um, there's a couple of safeties that might fit the mold. Landon Collins, Terrell Edmonds, um, Deshaun Elliott. Um, Larry Ogunjobi is still out there. I would not be shocked if the Bears brought him in either an incentive-laden deal or on a one-year deal. Um, but I feel like they're probably going to beef the rest of their roster up on defense with the draft. Which is fine. Um, on offense, the current batch of wide receivers they have are Darnell Mooney, Byron Pringle, Equinemius St. Brown, Daz Newsome, the Simba Webster, Isaiah Coulter. Uh, you, you definitely need to get at least one more guy. I would not even be sad if you got two um, in the draft. Your tight ends, you got Cole Komet, Jesper Horstead, and Ryan Griffin. I'm okay with Ryan Griffin. They just brought in, but I... I'm a little surprised they didn't give an opportunity to Jesse James because he had built like a nice rapport with, uh, with Justin Fields in the preseason, at least. Um, and he's still under 30. He'd come in a cheap contract. Uh, I'm a little surprised they didn't give him that opportunity, but Ryan Griffin is fine. Um, Just for Horstead TE one, baby. Let's go. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, no, I mean, I, I truly feel like Jesper Horstead could be a very effective tight end if he's just used more. When the, the opportunities he's been given, he's made well of them. He's going to be he's going to be that move tight end. He's going to be the the one that goes more into receiving routes. Um, so don't be shocked if you see good numbers from him. Yeah, I mean, remember how good he was in the preseason last year Absolutely. when they actually used him. Yep. And then the team as a whole forgot how to use tight ends. Yep. Yep. And hopefully, hopefully this new regime can get more out of Cole Komet because Cole Komet was really frustrating to watch last year. I think the most frustrating thing to watch was him not being able to create any separation or to just overpower somebody, overmatch somebody. That's what you want a receiving tight end to do. You want them to, you know, out muscle the other guy. And he was just never able to do that. Yeah. So I, I think they're set at tight end. I don't, I, maybe they take an undrafted rookies, 
But I think those are the three you're probably going to carry onto the roster. Um, I'm assuming they're going to take four tackles. The Tevin Jenkins, Larry Borum right now are your starters. Your backups right now are Lachavius Simmons, who I'm okay with him being on the roster as a fourth tackle, but I think you probably want a veteran swing tackle. I agree. Uh, Because otherwise, it's Lachavius Simmons and Tyrone Wheatley Jr. Mm, uh, Yeah, I don't like that. Whose dad, Tyrone Wheatley, I was a big fan of because he played running back at Michigan. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, So I think they desperately need a a veteran swing tackle. Again, I'm going to say I would love to see Jason Peters. I know he doesn't fit their mold, but I wouldn't be surprised if that guy signed a one-year deal and played mentor and only came in to, to back people up. Um, guards, I think they need to beef up the guard spot. Uh, cause right now it's Cody Whitehair and probably Dakota Dozier, uh, your starters and Dieter Eiselin and Willie Wright as your backups. Um, I'm assuming they're either going to sign another free agent guard or they're going to draft somebody fairly high because I don't see anybody starting opposite Cody Whitehair that's on this roster to start week one um, center Lucas Patrick, Sam Mustafer. I would imagine you're going to bring in a undrafted rookie center to compete with Sam Mustafer. So I, Lucas Patrick is your center. Unless, unless you find a stud center in the draft and then kick Lucas Patrick over to guard. I'm fine with that too. Um, QB. I think they'll keep two. So it's probably Justin Fields, Trevor Semyon. Nick Foles is probably going to get traded or cut. Ryan Willis will be on the practice squad. You got one fullback, Kari, Blossom game, and your three running backs, Montgomery, Herbert, and Darrington Evans. So I don't know how much you upgrade running back or quarterback. Offensive line, yes. Wide receiver, yes. Um, and... Uh, there's actually some wide receivers that could be solid are still under 30. Will Fuller, Sammy Watkins, Keelan Cole, Deandre Carter, um, guard. There's still Trey Turner and Eric flowers, who I think started almost every game of theirs last year. And Trey Turner played for the new bears offensive line coach last year. So I would not be shocked if Trey Turner came on, if they did not draft somebody early. I mean, if they draft somebody, in the second or third round, probably not. But if they draft somebody, they don't draft a guard or they draft somebody fourth, fifth, sixth round, I would not be shocked to see Trey Turner as Bears guard next year. And then offensive tackle, there's Tyrell Crosby and Daryl Williams and Julian Davenport and Jason Spriggs and Sam Tevai, who all could be that veteran swing tackle if need be. Um, so I, I reprioritized. I mean, these aren't in the same order, but the desperate needs for the Bears, veteran swing tackle, uh, another starting guard, more wide receiver talent, a cornerback opposite Jalen Johnson, a starting Sam linebacker, and another safety. I think it's all reasonable. Um, and then I did a mock draft without any trades or anything. Um, and I picked... Uh, at 39, I had Kenyon Green, who's a guard from Texas A&M. I think he'd be a steal so at that you, spot. So you took a guard before a wide receiver. I did. I did. Um, so I think you're going to hit a little bit of a lull in wide receivers. I think you're going to probably have, I'm going to guess six drafted in the first round. And then <clears throat> maybe one in the second round before the Bears. There'll be a couple left for the Bears. So I think they'll have the opportunity for either a wide receiver at that 39 pick, but the same crop of wide receivers probably still there at 48 um, or at least similar. So they, I had them drafting Kenyon Green, who's a stud guard, should be a first rounder. I, he, in the, the mock simulator I did, he fell to 39, so I took him. I have George Pickens from Georgia a wide mm-hmm. receiver mm-hmm. who, if he is healthy, he's a stud. Mm-hmm. Um, it is just the injury. The reason that he will not go in the first. 
Well, you know, th- there is an opportunity for him to drop to you. I feel like with that injury, we've seen players drop to the Bears before. Jalen Johnson, Eddie Jackson, you know, it, it's happened before. And George Pickens has the best hands in the draft. That guy only dropped like something like 3% of the targets. Oh, Hans. Whereas if you look like uh, um, Jamar Chase last year, I think had like 8% drop. So it's pretty, it's pretty damn good. Um, he's got the size. He's got the speed. Um, I watched him run some drills and he just, he made other good cornerbacks look stupid with his move. Um, I, I think George Pickens could be good as long as the, the medicals check out, which I don't have any reason to believe that they wouldn't. Um, I have them taking, uh, Kyler Gordon, a cornerback out of Washington with the 71 pick, um, Bo Melton wide receiver out of Rutgers with the 148 Malcolm Rodriguez out of Oklahoma state, a linebacker for 150 and 186 Yusuf Corker, the safety out of Kentucky. All right. All right. Well, you know, I mean, you look at all that and you know, when I said you drafted a guard before a wide receiver, I'm not necessarily saying I disagree. That's a bad thing. I mean, they're both needs offensive lineman and a wide receiver. So you know, I could see either way. I feel like if I if I were a betting man, I see the Bears taking either or a wide receiver or a guard with their first pick in the second round. I mean, that's that to me seems like the most likely. I mean, maybe if I were to add a third, maybe somebody in the secondary, but I feel like guard or wide receiver has the highest chance of what they're going to take with their first pick. It's honestly, I think it's going to be a little bit. I think. Ryan Poles is a very smart guy. I think he's very methodical with this. I have a feeling it's going to be a lot of how the draft plays out. Um, I mean, yes, the, it's hard to predict what exactly is going to go down, and I'm sure he's not going to want to reach if he feels like he doesn't have to. Like but. Ryan Pace, I think Ryan Pace was a good evaluator. It's just when he fell in love with somebody early, he was going to trade whatever to get that guy, and he admitted it. He said that he his philosophy was – there's somebody you want you no matter what you go get them i will get that tight end even if i have to pay him 10 times what he's worth and i'm all for getting the guy you want but you know what have a backup plan because it's it's not worth it's not worth trading every draft pick from that year and your first round pick the next year for ricky williams like you know it's just you don't you don't fall in love with a guy so much that it screws over your entire plan. And if your entire plan revolves around you getting that one guy, then it was a shitty plan to begin with, you know? Uh, So while I appreciate, you know, if there's a guy you really want and you're like, I think he's going to, you know, if, if we're, if you draft somebody at 39 and you're waiting at 48 and you go, Oh, you know what? Somebody, I think somebody's going to try trade up and trade for that guy. And you move up a couple spots to get that guy. Okay. No harm, no foul. You, you know, you trade a next year's fifth to move up a couple spots. Okay. I can live with that, but uh, you can't do it consistently and you can't keep doing it with first and second rounders and trading completely back into a round. Uh, it's just it's not sustainable. So I think it's going to play out a little bit and, you know, I've done a ton of mock draft simulations and there's some spots where I'm just like, you know what? I don't like any of the picks available 39. I feel like anybody that's in a position of need is a reach and all the players I was hoping would fall to me aren't there. And in those situations, I'm like, okay, let me just trade back a few spots. And I, I don't trade back a ton, but I'm like, all right, I'll trade back eight spots, 10 spots and see, see how that shifts. You know, if I can pick up uh, another pick in this year's draft by going back to take the same person I was going to draft anyway. Okay. That works for me. Um, So I think a lot of it is going to see how this plays out. If the wide receiver that they love is still there at 39, they'll probably take him. But if, if their first 
you know, the realistic expectations of wide receiver are not there. All right. Well then who else is there is uh Roger McCreary from the cornerback from Auburn there. Okay. He could be a, a pick. Um, a couple of the guards, are they there? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, the, uh, there's a, there's a tackle from, I think Western Michigan um, that hasn't been playing football that long. And he's, he might fall and like, okay, you could use him as your swing tackle and just sort of wean him into things. And if he ends up playing well, you know, then you could kick Borum or Jenkins into the guard spot. Um, you know, I, I, there's a couple different ways you can go. And I think it's going to be how it plays out. And I'm hoping that Ryan Poles has done all the war games on this of, of, you know, hundreds of scenarios and what you do if all these guys are off the board and you have to pick somebody that's not really your first, you know, your first option. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's very fair. Um, on a lot you of don't know how I, you don't exactly know how it's going to play out because you made that point earlier, how with green Bay and the chiefs potentially taking wide receivers guys could drop and that can just change the way things go. You know, and there's always a, a Raiders who might draft somebody where you're like, what the fuck were they doing? Like when they had drafted Alex Leatherwood and everyone went, what are they doing? And they drafted a guy that was probably like a third round pick in the first middle of the first round and maybe, maybe a second round pick, but they drafted him like a whole round early, not just a few picks. And that throws off things. Sometimes it's a, it's a, you know, you get a run on players because uh, if you're like, okay, you know, you, I need a wide receiver. And then you start seeing a run on wide receivers. Then you see teams start trading up to make sure that they get one they want. But if the first domino doesn't fall, maybe they last a little longer. There's always weird things with the draft and the first Mm -hmm. this year is never fully predictable. There's, I mean, there's some years where you're like, okay, the first five or six picks, maybe in the first 10 fairly obvious Mm -hmm. this year is, I don't even know who's going to go. Number one, it's going to be, no, we don't know. Um, So this draft could be wild. It could. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. There's no Trevor Lawrence this year. There's no, uh, Andrew Luck or RG three it's yeah it, it is wide open you're, you're absolutely right and that could change the way we see what the Bears are going to do too would I still bet on a wide receiver or guard being the play with their first pick yes but hey you never know you, you never know what I just want to see is Ryan Poles not do any panic moves because how many times did we see that with Ryan Pace My, what I want to see yeah I don't want to see a panic move I want to see the first three picks the bears make be contributors this year. Mm -hmm. I think that's a necessity. Um, And I don't really care what position if they end up like, Oh crap, there was a run on wide receivers. We didn't want to spend the draft capital trade up. We ended up with a, a linebacker and a guard. Okay. I mean, you need another linebacker. It's like, as long as those guys come in and play right away. And we've already seen, Ryan Poles was an undrafted rookie himself. He's admitted he has an affinity for undrafted rookies. We're going to see a shit ton of them come into the bears. I mean, it's a, it's a selling point. Sometimes it's like, you know, the agents of these players, because they, once the the draft ends, then it's like, okay, there's a guy, there's a bunch of guys that should have been drafted that are out there. And at this point, it's kind of better that you don't get drafted in like the seventh round because you can choose where you go you know, if you're a wide receiver, of course, you're going to go to a team that's wide receiver hungry or, you know, whatever, Get, you know, find a team that's going to give you the best opportunity to play. But if you're the bears, you go out there and be like, Hey, our GM was one of you guys. He did not get drafted. He has an affinity for you guys. I think you're going to be able to, to get some of the top guys. I, I think you're going to see opportunity given to undrafted rookies to, to win spots. It's not going to be, well, you know, he better play his ass off. If an if a undrafted rookie earns a spot, he's going to get a spot. I, I'm, I, I would bet money on it. Well, you know, I was telling people this earlier today, how this upcoming Bears team, you know, it could look like 
just a band of misfits. But you know what? Sometimes when you put teams together like this, you often get surprises. And if the coaching staff, and this is if we don't know how good they're going to be, but if the staff is good at what they do, then the right coaching and the right placement with some of these guys, you can see results. The Bears are not going to be flashy. Sure, Justin Fields could be the flashy one, and you know he's the most important position, but overall, as a team dynamic, you know, I don't see a scenario where they're going to have a number one receiver that's top five in the league in yards and touchdown catches. I don't think you're going to see a defense that's going to turn as many absurd balls into turnovers like you saw, whether it was 2006 or 2018. But you could see it function just like a well-oiled machine. Not flashy, not great, but effective. I'm not saying that's going to happen. It could be another miserable year. I'm not counting on a lot of great things on happening, but it is the NFL and it's possible. And you can find ways to win without just having the flashiest guys. And there's an opportunity here to find a lot of diamonds in the rough. You might find a lot of diamonds in the rough. You might find a few diamonds in the rough, or you might not find many at all. We won't know until they actually play, but It'll just be interesting to see how this Bears team functions as a unit. And because you have a new coaching staff, it means the possibilities are kind of endless right now. There's a lot of directions this could go. It could go bad. It could go okay. It could go great. It's not like we're building this team with the same coaching staff around. If you were doing this, you'd feel pretty much hopeless either way. But with a new coaching staff, maybe they get the most out of a number of these guys. The biggest driver of what this team is going to be look like, you know, if they're good or not, is going to be the offensive scheme and Justin Fields improvement from year one to year two. Of course, that is it. If the offensive system maximizes his talents and protects him and he takes he improves ball security, which I think is doable. Um, it's, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and you let him be aggressive with uh, better players, better playmakers. I, I could see a marked improvement and I don't, I'm not even looking at wins and losses of this bears team. I'm looking at being competitive. If right. you lose a game 27, 24, 24, 21, but your offense did okay. And your defense just didn't make enough stops, but you're competitive. And it was close in the fourth quarter. Okay. It's, I just don't want to be embarrassed. And, and there was the last three years, there was way too many games that I was just absolutely embarrassed as a fan. And I just don't want that. That's all I want. Nah, yeah. Don't be embarrassing. Yep. I, I'm right there with you, man. Truly am. If you see progress, even if it's not, in the, it's, it's kind of like the Cubs this year. If you see progress without it being in the win loss column, then you're going to take that as a win. I, you know, frankly, Sean, I'm not getting myself too overhyped about the bears. I'm not, I just don't feel anything right now. I don't feel overly optimistic. I don't feel overly pessimistic. I'm just going to sit here and see how it plays out. Like, I just don't have that many feelings right now. The well, only the, thing I can thing is, say is this team could be so drastically different on paper from right now, as we're recording the show uh, until, you know, May 10th sure. after, after no, the you're draft's right. over and they sign. this could be a completely different team because if you're like, all right, they got a stud guard in the draft and they got George Pickens. And they went out and signed a, a veteran swing tackle like Jason Sprigg, who was a starter for several years for the Packers. You bring him in as a swing tackle and you, you know, you fill in some of these spots You're like, okay, maybe they could be fairly competitive. Um, but if the draft, you know, they draft a guy that they think is going to be a stud, but is injured or, you know, whatever the case may be, it, it could be go a completely different way. But this team is going to look a lot different in a month from now as, than it does right now. Yeah, and it's going to function a lot different than it has the past two years. Whether how much better that is is remain to be seen, but it's definitely going to be different. And I will not feel comfortable about even guessing at win losses because I have you can't no, right now. I have no idea what the team is going to look like. I don't know what the the defense is going to look like or the offense. And the good thing is, is they're going to have one of the easiest schedules in the NFL. Yeah, that's true. I mean, their schedule is not that bad. 
And, you know, look at the NFC. You have Green Bay. You have Tampa Bay with Tom Brady coming back. You have the defending champion Rams. How many other teams scary? Like, I'm not saying the Bears are better than everyone else, but I mean. The the AFC or the NFC East is going to be bogus. Dog turd tacos, as you like to say. Um, I mean, the Eagles will probably go like eight and nine and win that division because I just, I I think the Cowboys are going to fall hard next year. I just have that feeling. The Giants aren't going to be any good. And we'll see what happens with the 49ers. They're a well-coached team, but. I mean, the the commanders? No, the 49ers. Oh, thought you were talking about the, the East. No, no, I'm I'm just oh, talking about yeah. teams in the, in the NFC in general. The Eagles yeah. might be okay, uh, I, but they're gearing up to get rid of their quarterback. Right, uh, they're 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 totally trading for multiple draft picks in the first round next year, so they can move up. So right. they, they they don't think that they've got the quarterback, so they might be okay, but not good. Right, um, right. The Commanders are going to be meh. You mentioned the Commanders. Yeah, I just they, think they're going to be. They meh. might. Yeah, they might be. It's funny. The uh, NFL.com still lists them on the standings as Washington Football Team. Hmm. Um. Uh. The Packers. I mean, they gave up some key defensive pieces, and they lost Devonte Adams. And you have Aaron Rodgers. That's all that have, matters. I mean, they're going to win the division, but if Aaron Rodgers gets injured, oh, they're screwed. This team is going to go off the 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 rails. Like it is going to be bad. Right. And um. I, I, the Viking, I, the Vikings. I don't think the Vikings are going to be bad, but I don't think they're going to be world beaters either. No, they're sort of gearing up like the Bears for future. The Lions are still in a rebuild. Mm-hmm. They're they're really trying to tear this down to the studs. Mm-hmm. The Bucks are going to be good. The Saints are not going to be good. The Falcons are not going to be good. The Panthers are not going to be good. The Rams are going to be good. I think the Cardinals are going to come back to reality. Yeah, I, just, I don't think they're going to be bad, but I don't think they're going to be anything special. The 49ers, I think, are going to be. We'll see maybe, what Trey Lance does. This is uh, his year. It may, may not be. Yeah, I, I'm not I'm not so sure about Trey Lance. I mean, I don't think Jimmy Garoppolo is good, but they found ways to win with him. And I don't know if they're going to be able to trade him. This might I be don't one, know either. It might be one year more a year of Jimmy G. And the Seahawks are going to be abysmal. Yeah, the Seahawks, I think the Seahawks are going to be the team that's going to be abysmal this year, draft a quarterback next year. I, I I don't think they're going to be down very long, but this year, I don't think they're going to be any good. Yeah, so, I mean, the Rams, the Bucks, and the Packers are going to be the class of the NFC. So, I mean, the Bears got a puncher's chance, but if ever, if all, just like the Cubs, everything has to go Right. Right. Yeah. Um. So, uh. Yeah, I mean that's it's just exciting. It'll be I'm so excited for this draft. This is going to be. I love the draft every year, but I think this is going to be a big one because we see a new GM, um, and a team that's in transition and really get to see what they're going to do. For sure. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about? Nope. I think I've said my piece. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. I want to thank everybody so much for listening. Please hit subscribe however you listen to podcasts, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, Spotify, et cetera. Share this podcast with your friends. That's how we grow the show. Uh, follow us on social media at Swirsky Sports, Facebook.com slash Swirsky Sports, Swirsky Sports.com, Fan Pat 2 for Alex and Alexander J. Pat Creative.com for all the cool stuff Alex does. And, uh, And again, thank you guys so much for listening. And until next time, bear down. Cubs win! What a lucky break! The good Lord wants the Cubs to win! We thank Ditka and God for all they have provided. Cubs win! Cubs win! Cubs win! Oh, I don't want her. You can have her. She's a Packer fan. She can't fit in my van. And she looks like... Remember, New Yorkers, smoking crack is not legal on the plains. Bears, 31 to negative 7. The Bears. Oh, when the Bears go bearing down. <laughs>